Well, thanks very much for the invitation to speak on this. And when, when I was first approached, I said, well, I don't want to be the designated downer here because I am, of course, a medicinal chemist by training. I'm probably more of a chemical biologist by now, but I've been doing industrial drug discovery now for over 30 years, so several different companies, as you would imagine, over that time span. So I have a lot of pretty strong opinions about different ways to do drug discovery, what works and what doesn't, mostly what doesn't. And I've had a lot of experience interacting with my computational colleagues over the years and with my structural biology colleagues. So what I've been asked to do here is give a sort of perspective from someone with that background on what protein structure prediction, especially the most recent advances in it, will mean for drug discovery. And I'm going to, I'm going to sound worse than it actually is for a little bit, but I think I'll redeem myself on the last slide or so. So what I want to do is I want to give a view of what it's like for someone in my position doing drug discovery in the pharma industry, especially from the chemist's eye view, what the problems are that we have, and then we'll talk about where protein structure can fit in. So um, I'm going to go into a medicinal chemist's immediate problems, which are largely compound related, the larger problems, which are project related. And then after that, <clears throat> the overarching problems or problem, which are more portfolio related. So this is sort of gradually bringing your head up from the bench and looking around. So at the bench, when a project is going or starting off, a medicinal chemist's immediate problem is, of course, what compounds should I make next? Because that is, you know, the function of the MedChem unit in a project is to keep turning out structure activity relationship information by making new compounds. Sometimes you're making them more or less at random just to see what's out there. And sometimes you're hypothesis driven. You're saying, okay, we need to put a methyl here. We, we need to have another hydrogen bond acceptor over here, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the question. Which compound should I make next? Second question is, how should I be making these? Some of these ideas and suggestions are a lot easier to put into reality than others. So you've got the operational <clears throat> difficulty, sheer organic synthesis of how am I going to do this? And then have I made what I thought I made? We spend actually a reasonable amount of time making sure of that. And that's something that, you know, since I write the blog in the pipeline, I get a lot of contact with people who are outside of drug discovery, or even outside of science. And I find that's something that most of them are amazed at because they've watched too many TVs and TV shows and movies where people do this and they immediately know that's right. And then they go on to the next and they immediately know it worked. And then they go on to the next. And of course, we spend a lot of time trying to validate what it was that we did. So that first question is the traditional one during a project, and that can be driven by potency, by selectivity, PK, a lot of other factors. Second question, as I said, is sheer organic synthesis. And that comes up when you're doing scaffold hopping, you need to make the compound chiral, et cetera. And not to mention process chemistry, where that is the, over, the main question, how should I make this most reproducibly quickly and cheaply? And the third question, it's mostly an interface with the analytical methods and making sure that we have interpreted these data correctly. Okay, those are the bench problems, the day-to-day -day stuff. The medicinal chemist's larger problems are, well, I talked about driving on potency or selectivity, but you need to ask yourself, how potent and selective do these things need to be? What's our goal? And this gets a little fuzzy. <clears throat> I've worked on projects where management said, just keep going, just make them more and more potent, more and more selective. That's not such a great idea. There has to be a cutoff because you can go on with that forever, you know, as long as the money runs it, is, is still there. Another question is what counter screens <clears throat> should I be worried about? Not, you know, we talked about driving on selectivity, but that presupposes that you know what you're being selective against and you may or may not. The same with tox. Uh, we have a few assays like, you know, HERG and the like that can predict to a point some kinds of tox problems, but there are a lot of others where it's, it's pretty much an open landscape. 
So that first question <clears throat> could be very difficult to answer, depending on how much is known about the related proteins, about the, the tone, as we say, the system being targeted. How hard do you have to hit this to get a physiological effect? If you're designing, say, an enzyme inhibitor, do you have to completely shut the system down? Or are there effects that are going to kick in if you just knock it down 20%, 50%? You're also going to have to say, how good are my assays to measure such things? The question of translatability is probably the single biggest success factor in any drug discovery project, and it's one of the hardest to address. Now, that second question, well, that one really does get into the knowns and unknowns and the known unknowns and unknown unknowns of a project. Toxicology is full of unknown unknowns. Um, it's safe to say that the tox problems that end programs in the clinic, these horrible things that happen in phase three where you're like, oh no, none of those were things that you were counter screening against earlier in the project. You wouldn't have gotten to phase three if you had been counter screening against these things. No, these are, these are things that come from a, a totally unexpected direction. Something that your compounds are doing that's off target and bad or something about your target that is bad that you didn't realize from just your cellular assays or perhaps even the two week rodent talks. Now, now we get to the medicinal chemist's biggest problem, which is what project should I be working on in the first place? That is a tough one. Should it be this project I'm on right now? Is this the best use of my time? Or should I be somewhere else? Where might that be? How do we know? How sure are we about that? Should I even be in this therapeutic area at all? Should the company be spending money in neurodegeneration? Should it be off somewhere else? Or another one entirely? This is the big one because this touches on the central fact of industrial drug discovery which is that 80 to 90% failure rate in the clinic. That is the thing that drives all the strangeness about the drug industry. Almost every question about the pharma industry that starts off with, I wonder how come they, the answer is because 80 to 90% of our compounds fail in the clinic. So portfolio management, target ID, target selection, disease selection, are all incredibly important and incredibly hard to do. All right, so let's go back and look at this from the standpoint of what computational methods, and specifically for this talk, protein structure can do for us here. What compounds should I make next? It actually has a real role to play because that is the classic domain of a computationally driven approach, modeling against a protein structure to suggest new compounds. That's where you get these hypotheses of maybe we need to put a methyl group here or hydrogen bond donator over here is bad. Let's take that away because we can see it's clashing with this residue, et cetera, et cetera. Now the structural data need to be really good to get this to work because the energies that we're talking about, of course, are quite small. This has been, I guess, a, a constant problem for computational drug design for decades now, is that the energy differences that turn a mediocre compound into a great one are sometimes, in fact, many times within the error bars of computation, which is not good. I mean, this is getting better all the time. And I am perhaps sometimes a short-term pessimist about computational approaches, but I'm a long-term optimist because I see no reason why these things can't get to the level where they generate tremendously good information. It's just very hard to get there. We've been trying for years. So as far as the structural data, predictions of how a protein is going to behave when it's in solution, <clears throat> as opposed to when it's out in the vacuum or when it's packed into a crystal structure, predictions of solution phase behavior and of potential conformational changes would be exceptionally valuable. These conformational changes could be, for example, well, some of you may remember the um, HIV protease story where it turned out that there's a huge flap of the protein that could easily open and close. It was really balanced on a thermodynamic knife edge. And that was, of course, not apparent from the crystal structure, but it turned out to be true. <clears throat> it 
it would be very good to know about that. It'd be very good to know about conformational changes due to allosteric sites or protein-protein interactions, and just on compound binding, because you see a lot of induced fit type things, which are pretty difficult to model. So protein structure fits in there, but these other two issues are sheer chemistry problems, frankly. I'm not even going to go into those from this standpoint because protein structure doesn't have much to tell us there. <clears throat> How about those larger problems? Problem is, is that they are, as I mentioned, a sort of notorious jungle of unknowns. And I think some of these are gonna be the last frontier, the tox problem for, for quite some time to come. How potent and selective do they need to be? That is a tough one because there may not be enough known about the system. Even in, even in a healthy system, much less a diseased one, to make a useful prediction. And I have trouble figuring out where protein structure at least immediately fits in there. It can be part of a larger understanding, and I'll come back to that on the last slide or so, but immediately it has, it's hard to find a good bearing for that. And applying computational techniques to these entire biological systems is fraught with difficulty. I'll just leave it at that. So these larger issues get away from the importance of protein structure in general. They start to deal with the larger systems. And at that point, you're going to get into some pretty high altitude stuff. So that especially applies to the biggest problem. What project should I be working on? And despite some press releases, I think that this, which I think is the single biggest question in drug discovery, is currently beyond help by computational means. I will be thrilled to be proven wrong about that. In fact, if saying this motivates some people to go out there and prove me wrong, so much the better. But this, this is a, a major difficulty that we've been facing. And the only way I can see out of that difficulty is to understand a lot more about the biology of health and disease. That's not a very sexy proposal. That's not going to go out there and get me $100 million in VC funding immediately because just going out and telling people, gosh, we just need to understand a lot more in every direction doesn't get the pulse racing. But I think that boring, repetitive, stupid answer is the correct answer to this problem. So the overall place of protein structure for me as a medicinal chemist the last 30 years I don't think that I have ever worked on a project where knowledge of the protein structure was a rate limiting step. I thought really hard about that. And I really think it's true. Now that may, as I say, make me the designated downer here, but I'm going to turn that around and say that, remember that for the past 30 years, I have been doing traditional drug discovery by traditional means that does not really rely much on protein structure. If, however, we can reach a new era where we have intimate knowledge of a huge number of protein structures and can start to apply these, especially, as I say, for protein-protein interactions, larger protein complexes, and if we can get a handle on those changes that happen when compounds bind, when proteins bind to each other, when allosteric sites are occupied or not, this could change. Now, this is a big ask. This is a big program that I'm talking about here, but that may be one of the ways in which we get that broader knowledge of human biology I'm talking about. We're going to have to, well, as Francis Bacon said back in the 1600s, you know, we're going to have to discover the secret motions and causes of things to the affecting of all things possible. That's from his book, The New Atlantis. And these are secret motions and causes. And if we are going to effect all things possible, we may well have to know them. So this is where I actually do get happy about the advances in protein structure prediction, because getting structures on these things is, of course, not so easy experimentally. Of course, we have a lot of things in the PDB. We have a lot of things being generated now by cryo-EM but there are a lot of proteins out there and they're dynamic. This is the, something that cryo-EM and X-ray will not give you, is that solution behavior, is 
which parts are more flexible and how do they flex? This is where I think that computational structure prediction can really shine and address these real world protein behaviors that we can't address by the current analytical experimental methods. So if you guys can get to that point, then you're poised to really open up a new world of knowledge for us. And we can really start to figure out what's going on with these protein systems and perhaps see the tone of these things without having to do vast amounts of experiment. The relationships between things that we should be worried about for selectivity. And we can start to piece together a model of cellular activity that is maybe for once meaningful. So that's my optimistic view. It just means a lot of work. And I think that, for example, the, the recent protein folding successes, I don't see that as having won the race. I see that as having won the race to get to the starting line. Welcome. Thanks. I'll be glad to take any questions.